going to go ahead and call the uh, meeting to order. Prince George's County House Delegation, uh, Friday, March 12th, 2021, about 9.02 a.m. For the record, I am Delegate Eric Barron. Glad to be joined with you all this morning, two weeks from crossover. Um, uh, for our morning prayer, uh, the Honorable Delegate Mary Lehman. Good morning. Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let us bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for the joy of waking up today to do work that makes such a positive difference in people's lives. Grant that we may spend the hours of this day gladly serving you and our fellow Marylanders. Help us today to make wise and compassionate decisions to treat all others, including our colleagues, as we would want to be treated. Help us to be patient with ourselves and each other as we deal with our worries and disappointments. Remind us of our blessings and good fortunes at a time of great suffering and give us the continued resolve to defeat COVID and help our neighbors to get back on their feet. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you so much. Um, uh, just to let you all know, I have a, a conflict this morning. I have to be before the Rules Committee of the Maryland Judiciary at 9.30. Um, but obviously we're in good hands with our first vice chair, Delegate Julian Ivey. Um, uh, but I am pleased to have an introduce our uh, speaker this morning uh, from Melwood, um, President Larissa Coutts. Are you with us? Yes. I see you there. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us this morning and, and uh, Thank you, Mr. Perez, for uh, reaching out to us. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you all were able to join us this morning and work with our schedules. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to come before you. Um, and first, thank you for all of you for all your service um, and the work that you do um, for Maryland and for Prince George's County. Um, for those that, that don't know Melwood, uh, we are a very large nonprofit um, whose headquarters is located in Prince George's County. Uh, we employ over 1,600 um, individuals um, across various contract sites in the DC area, a thousand of whom have significant disabilities, um, primarily intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I have a few of my staff on, on camera that wanted to point out and introduce to all of you. Uh, Ms. Julian Cosgrove um, is our head of government relations. Uh, so I hope you'll get to know her um, well. And Marquesa Whittington, uh, who is the head of our community engagement, um, who has been with Melwood um, for a very long time and is incredible uh, with engaging the community and, and finding out how we can best serve the community that we're in. Uh, so Melwood started uh, 58 years ago. In 1963, there was a group of parents that had adult children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and they thought that they were worth more than being institutionalized or being set aside in congregate settings. They wanted them to find work and jobs to have that dignity of a paycheck um, and the independence of being able to earn their own money to help um, give back to the family. That was unheard of um, at that point. Um, people with disabilities were deemed untrainable, unemployable, um, and there, there really weren't people that were looking at this bold goal of employment. Uh, so now for 55 years, for 58 years, we've been providing jobs and services uh, to people with disabilities in the metropolitan, DC metropolitan area. We're one of the largest employers of people with disabilities in, in the United States. Um, and we offer job training, employment, life skills improvement, community support, and recreation opportunities to people with disabilities uh, and their families, including veterans um, with post-traumatic stress, moral injury, traumatic brain injury, um, and military sexual trauma. 
Uh, we're an Ability One nonprofit agency, so we provide services to the federal government as well as to the state of Maryland, um, through which we employ people with disabilities. Uh, we clean the FBI building downtown. We do total facilities maintenance at Fort Meade. We keep the base running. Um, our folks with disabilities are cleaning, doing groundskeeping, HVAC, electrical. We're finding jobs and new career paths for people with disabilities um, that go beyond just the traditional you know, you can be a janitor or you can mow the lawn. Uh, we want to be innovative. We want to grow the types of jobs that are available. Um, and one of the well, one of the projects through which we did that is a pilot called a Bill IT, where we've been teaching cybersecurity, um, Microsoft, um, helping young adults with autism, particularly get to a place um, where they can find a career in a tech company uh, and, and use their skills, um, but also be accommodated and served um, in the way that they need to. Uh, so COVID, COVID's been interesting. Um, I feel like it's been, it's been a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, it's been a huge challenge uh, to continue to serve some of our participants. Uh, we have a day program uh, through which we serve a large number of individuals um, that come to our facilities, and then we, we work with them at either at our facilities or in the community. Uh, we had to shut down uh, for quite some time uh, because of the you know, people with disabilities have an elevated, a significantly elevated risk um, of COVID-19. They're three times more likely to die from the disease uh, versus people without disabilities. Um, because they have underlying health conditions, because of socioeconomic contributors, group living and cohabitation, um, and intellectual processing and social behaviors that are required to maintain COVID-19 safely. Uh, when we were able to restart our day programs, um, I went through each program that we have and toured it and, and talked to the individuals. And can I just tell you that the folks with disabilities were way better at keeping their masks on and above their noses than some of our staff. <laughs> um, so you know, we've been, we've been lucky in that we've had a number of positive cases, but we've had zero transmission um, within any of our contract sites or our programs. Um, and so I'm really proud of our team for, for being able to quickly quarantine, send folks home um, and let them have the support they need. I'm also really proud of the fact that we haven't had to do have layoffs or large furloughs um, because of the help of Prince George's County, because of the help of the state of Maryland. Um, we also serve in Virginia and don't tell them I said this, but um, they've been a lot harder <laughs> um, to get help from um, because, you know, Maryland has helped pay us retention payments so that our direct support professionals that don't earn a lot of money, but they spend their lives dedicated to serving people with disabilities. You know, we were able to have money just to retain them on our payroll so they weren't sent home um, and left uh, to their own devices to try to survive. Um, in this space, so we are we are very grateful. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've seen with people with intellectual disabilities is the ability to actually get the vaccination. Uh, and I think it's not just the the sort of the bureaucracy, the trying to figure out where online you sign up. It's also you know they have the the processing and social behavior skills that make it extra difficult. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have. Um, you know, laptops, computers often that they're able to access. Um, so we are very excited that Melwood has been chosen as a site um, where in partnership with Giant Pharmacy, we, met, we did 100 vaccinations last week and we're gonna do 400 more next week. Um, and we're focusing on our participants and employees with significant disabilities. Uh, and hopefully we can expand further uh, to, to be a site where someone with a disability can come and receive the vaccination in a way that works for them and, and have the supports that Melwood provides uh, to be able to get that. You know, we, we pivoted when, when COVID hit, we started finding ways to get laptops and phones in the hands of our participants and also hotspots because we qu quickly found that, you know, all of our employees have what they need to be able to provide services virtually, but it's not something we've ever tried to do on a massive scale. We serve about 2,500 people a year. Um, so just imagine the number of folks that we had to suddenly try to find ways to put technology in their hands. And we've been very grateful for the community, for donors, corporate, individual, as well as the government in, in Maryland to help us be able to do that. Um, I'm hoping that that opens up the doors for much more virtual services in the future to be able to expand what we do beyond just the in-person service, which is difficult for so many people. Um, if you're living in rural Maryland, if you're living without public transportation, being able to get to a Melwood is difficult enough. And, you know, we've been providing drivers and vans for a long time. Um, but frankly, the reimbursement rates uh, from the state do not cover those costs. And they also don't cover the cost of our direct support professionals. 
So we've been, you know, we're lucky that we're also a federal contractor and we do get paid for services for the federal government and we're able to use some of that margin to cover um, the shortfall. But that's, you know, that's something Ms. Julen and Marquesa will be working with me um, to help, you know, figure out how to how to close that gap for so many other nonprofits in the state that don't have um, what Melwood has. We've been I talk about custodians and I talk about getting past just telling someone with a disability that they can clean floors or or bathrooms. But let me just tell you that in the last year, those folks are essential workers. And we have have had a a level of pride and dedication and work that our folks have shown to keep government buildings clean and sanitized and and make it safe for the government to keep working. Um, So it's it's been really great to see folks step up. They've been going to work when everyone else has had the... um, the ability to telework and stay home. Um, And they've been doing an amazing job and we're very, very proud proud of them. We had to get around the Metro shutdown. We reassigned drivers uh, to to do transportation. We haven't been able to have our camp um, for children with disabilities last year, unfortunately. Uh, We have about 108 acres down in Charles County uh, where we provide an integrated camp for children with disabilities and typically abled children. Uh, This year, we're gonna just do a day camp instead of an overnight camp but we're slowly ramping up uh, to get back to it. Uh, Same for our veterans retreats. We do retreats for veterans, like I said, with moral injury, PTSD, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, We've had to pivot to doing those virtually. Um, But the the opportunity there is that we've been able to serve many, many more veterans than we could have in person. Um, So we're looking at a hybrid model moving forward to do both virtual and in-person retreats down at our camp. Um, By the way, if you guys ever need a place to meet in, in person to have a nice retreat, I invite you to Charles County <laughs> and to check it out. Uh, so we, you know, we've sought to help everyone in need. We've sought to help our community. Um, we grow a lot of plants. Our, our roots, pun intended, was the horticultural, hort- Melwood Horticultural Training Center. We grow all the plants that get planted in front of the Kennedy Center, Kennedy Center downtown. Um, so every time you see things roll over, those are coming from our greenhouses um, grown by individuals with disabilities and we do horticulture therapy. Um, so we had a lot of plants that would have been destroyed because plant sales were canceled. So we donated them to, to hospitals and nurses. Um, and we also donated vegetable plants to food banks um, to try to help the community. Um, so how do we help drive the local economy? I wanted to give you a sense as well of, of the importance of what we do. We did an economic impact study in 2019 to see the impact of paying wages um, to untapped workers who otherwise would not be home and, are, and would be unemployed. Uh, 40% of our employees live in Prince George's County. That's 764 people. Uh, we pay more than 17, $17 million to employees in Prince George's County in wages. Um, and they in turn pay 686,000 of state and local taxes. Uh, Prince George's County receives the most induced economic in- output um, of what we do uh, because of our headquarters here. We're right across from Andrews Air Force Base. Um, and more than, more than 30, uh, 30% of the induced jobs in the community that are generated by our wages were in Prince George's County. Um, you know, we, we looked at all the counties in which we employ people, about a thousand people with disabilities, and they earn $27 million in wages, and they, they pay approximately $6 million in federal, state, and local taxes. Um, you know, we're fighting the good fight to try to, to do away with the minimum wage, the subminimum wage for people with disabilities. We were proud to, uh, to, to come and testify in front of the legislation in Maryland a few years ago. And Maryland has become one of the few states that has outlawed paying subminimum wage to people with disabilities. Um, I'm still fighting that fight in Virginia. Um, and at the federal level, I know that's been one of the key, um, key proposals of the Biden administration is to make sure that that does not happen um, across the nation anymore. Um, now, I will stop talking and I'll take questions if you guys have any about our programs and the people that we serve. Uh, I'm going to be discussing House Bill 655. We have- oh, you cut out. Delegate Harrison. Thank you. Um, I guess I don't really have a question. I, um, but I was um, I, I was not aware. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Let me say that first of all. And thank you for the work that you do in the community and the work that you do with um, those individuals with um, uh, disabilities. Um, I was not aware of the work you did with um, veterans and um, the, you know, the issues that they may be dealing with. And so 
um, kudos to you for that. And it's, you know, for those of us who may not be, um, you know, um, necessarily in that space, you know, having, uh, you know, worked with or, or, or have family members or loved ones that have these issues, it's, it's comforting to know that there's someone there who stands in the gap. And so thank you for that. And then I tell you, um, the last thing is that if I didn't love Melwood before, I love you now because when you said that you donated your plants to um, hospitals and nurses and then your vegetable plants to uh, food banks, that just really touched my heart. And so, uh, you know, I'm being a marshmallow right now, but thank you so much for who you are and what you do. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Delegate. Um, yeah, we see when we see a problem in the community, we try to fix it. Um, and, and one of the things Melwood has been blessed with is an excess of, of property and an excess of, 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 of opportunity to help folks. So, you know, we were donated seven acres of land across from Andrews Air Force Base from the federal government. And that's how we got started. Um, and when we saw an opportunity to, to to, to use a foundation grant from Charles County to purchase the land down in Charles County. Um, you know, when we saw a few years ago, we were only using that property for the summer for children with disabilities. And we thought, you know, how else can we serve an underserved population? And veterans uh, was one that, that we, we focused on. And I think now we're hearing a lot more about military sexual trauma. And, and we've actually had quite a few retreats focused entirely on that. Um, and I'm happy that there's, there's more focus on that as well. I'm Larissa Couts, by the way, I totally, you know, president and CEO. I've been president and CEO for since permanently since November. Um, before that I was interim since July uh, and I've been with Melwood for seven years. I was the in-house general counsel and then chief of staff. So didn't say anything about me, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for the work that you've been doing. Are there any other questions? Saying none. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so we're gonna move forward into delegation business. And I know that by county affairs uh, does have some legislation in front of us, uh, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Ivy. Uh, we had one uh, bill left on our docket, which we did not get to cover last week. Uh, and that is uh, MCPG 10421, the Maryland Park and Planning Commission Innovative Recreation. Uh, youth program. This was moved out of by county unanimously, four to zero. Uh, there was an amendment that was done. If uh, council could explain the amendment that, which by the way, uh, let me also say that uh, this was worked with park and planning. Council, Adrian Gardner uh, represented the agency and their board supports the bill as amended. Yes, David, so, just, yeah, thanks. Sure, uh, as amended, um, the bill uh, the, the amendment strikes the bill as it's written um, and as amended, the bill requires the county planning board in Prince George's County to include appropriate non-traditional recreational opportunities in its program of recreation. It further establishes the non-traditional recreation fund in the Park and Planning Commission to finance and account for the development and maintenance of these non-traditional recreational opportunities in the county. Uh, the bill requires the commission to record certain revenues in the fund and specifies what the fund may be used for. Um, uh, further, it also defines certain terms. And as uh, Delegate Bellarama said, this was voted uh, unanimously four to zero. Delegate Bellarama, you're, you're muted. I'd like, uh, Vice Chair, I'd like to move the bill as amended. Mr. Chair, what was the number of that bill again? Delegate Valderrama. Valderrama, what was the- MCPG 10421. Wait a PG 104. You said yes. 104, right? 21? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. we'd have to do a, just a reminder, have to do a um, voice vote for the amendment and then the bill as amended. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it on the bill as amended. Move the bill. 
Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, position? No. The yeah. ayes have it. What you looking for? It's unanimous, correct? Okay. Morgan, do we have to do a roll? Yeah, we have to do a roll call for the bill as amended. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Delegate Ben Barnes. Delegate Daryl Barnes. Yes. Delegate Charles. Delegate Davis. Delegate Fresnel. Yes. Delegate Fisher. Yes. Delegate Harrison. Yes. Delegate Healy. Yeah. Delegate Holt. No. Yes. Delegate Ivy. Yes. Delegate Jones. Yes. Delegate Lehman. Yes. Delegate Lewis. Yes. Delegate Pena Melnick. Yes. Delegate Proctor. Delegate Turner. Yes. Delegate Valderamo. Aye. Delegate Valentino Smith. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Washington. Yes. Delegate Watson. Delegate Williams. Yes. Chair Barron. Bill passed. Uh, we got here late. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you, Vice Chair Ivy. That concludes the docket from Bi County. We will not be meeting uh, for the rest of the session. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to our committee staff. Could we ensure that Delegate Healy was um, recorded? Thank you. Aye. Aye. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that we have uh, our County Affairs Chairwoman here. Uh, there's nothing on the docket, but would you like to address the delegation briefly? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to say, um, no, there's nothing on the docket. Um, Thank you so much, um, subcommittee, and um, be seeing you soon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairwoman Proctor, are you here with us this morning? Okay, um, there's nothing on that docket either. And then of course, uh, our, our wonderful Chairwoman Lehman uh, from the best law enforcement subcommittee. Thank you, Chair Ivy. We, we did some good work this session. We did not meet this week, but Going back to last week, we spent um, uh, all of the uh, delegation's time um, on the, um, the uh, uh, alcohol density zone bill, and then we were up against our floor schedule. So we did not get to discussing Delegate um, Williams truck height bill. That's, that's House Bill 626. She has presented that, did a good job of presenting that in the Environment and Transportation Committee, but there is an amendment that we need to adopt. Um, and I believe uh, Mr. Morgan, um, I don't know if Mr. Morgan or Ms. Williams is gonna present that. We have to vote on that first and then we have to vote on the amended bill. Uh, Del Delia Williams. I would say Mr. Morgan, you could give a summary of the amendments. Well, hold on, before we do go any further, um, there is uh, another piece of legislation on the agenda as well, House Bill 615, uh, but saying that Senator Jackson is not here yet, uh, we're going to move on to House Bill 626. Um, Mr. Morgan. Sure, okay. Um, so this, uh, this bill, um, as Delegate Lehman said, uh, the delegation moved out several weeks ago, um, but this is a, an additional amendment that we need to consider. Um, the amendment defines local jurisdiction. Um, it changes references from local law enforcement agency to local government agency and establishes a work group to assist in various activities before the installation of any vehicle height monitoring system in Prince George's County uh, can be uh, established, including, for example, evaluating existing signage. Um, Delegate Williams, I'll let you go into any more detail if you'd like, but that's the, that's the gist of the amendment. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. The um, local jurisdiction portion was amended to make clear that it also includes municipalities. As you know, we are a county of uh, 27 different municipalities. So I wanted to make sure that was very clear. Um, also, too, uh, we were working um, myself and I see Raya Harris is um, here with the county executive's office, as well as PGCMA, um, working also with the trucking association that had some concerns with the initial version of the bill. And so the work group is also part of the bill to try to address those concerns from the trucking association. Um, so we establish a work group that will uh, meet prior to the installation of any of the cameras to kind of deal with, um, I guess, to make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of the routes and things like that in which these large vehicles can transverse throughout the county um, and making sure that also other commercial vehicles like Amazon trucks and UPS trucks can still access the residential roads that they need to access to make deliveries to our residential, um, to the residential areas within the county. So that's the purpose of the amendments. I think Delegate Fisher has a question. Delegate Fisher. I have a question. Here we go. Oh, thank, oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to um, move favorable for the amendments. Oh, I had a question. Um, are there any other de uh, Delegate Healy, you have a question? Go, go I, ahead. I do, ha I do have a question. I got a, I got a phone call this morning um, from um, a lobbyist representing the trash collectors and the recycling companies and all that. Does do the amendments address those issues to those kind of trucks that, that are large, but they, you know, they have to come into the community. Right. And that's what the purpose of the work tickets is, the is to make sure to establish with all of the advocates um, a map system where, and this is similar. So this legislation is similar to a bill that passed last session with Baltimore County. And if you look at the Baltimore County bill, they had a work group as well, um, where the advocates met prior to the implementation um, of the, uh, vehicle height monitoring systems in Baltimore County um, just to establish kind of the routes and things like that. So I hadn't heard directly from the uh, trash uh, trucking industry. It was just more the overall broader trucking industry as well gotcha. as the Beverage Association because the Beverage Association obviously has large trucks that they use to um, distribute. Those were the only two um, industry folks that have reached out to my office that I'm aware of. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate your work on this. And I'm very happy to be enthusiastic in supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. So Delegate um, Fisher has made a motion on the amendments. Um, I will second. Second. Or Delegate Washington. No, second. Uh, you already second. did, Madam okay, Chair. So we have a motion <laughs> and a second. Mr. Morgan, do, can we do? Uh, yeah, voice vote is fine for the amendment. Okay, so all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So the aye. Aye. Thank you, Delegate Turner. <laughs> um, can uh, I have a motion favorable on the bill as amended? Move favorable as, on the bill as amended. Second. 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 Have a motion um, favorable and a second. Um, roll call. So, Delegate Layman, so the, the bill was moved out uh, favorable. Um, several weeks ago this is we're just considering the amendment and then the amendment will be brought in the standing committee so you don't have to go back on the bill so we don't have to adopt the the amended bill then no mm -hmm. okay um uh chair ivy mentioned a second bill i did not i'm sorry i did not recognize the number is this the croom road bill this house bill 615 Mr. Morgan, would you like to give a summary of the bill yeah, so uh, this bill is also one that um, the delegation move, uh, moved out favorably several weeks ago. Um, it was originally put in by then Delegate Jackson, now Senator Jackson, um, dealing with Sunday hunting in Prince George's County, Sunday deer hunting. Um, this is just an amendment. Uh, as that bill is moved on to the standing committee, this just like the one we just did is uh, just a further amendment that Senator Jackson wanted um, the delegation to consider um, so so the standing committee has an official opinion um, the amendment adds prince george's county to the list of counties in which a safety zone for archery hunters is 50 yards from a dwelling house residence church or other building or camp occupied by humans basically 
hunters cannot uh, fire, um, discharge a firearm or any other deadly weapon within 150 yards uh, of the, any of those dwelling spaces. Um, that's known as a safety zone. Basically, this bill says specifically for archery and in Prince George's County, that safety zone is shrunk from 150 yards to 50. It would still be 150 for any other firearm though. Thank you. I'd like to move the amendment. Second. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 In opposition? Opposed, no. We have Delegate Healy, Delegate Layman. Delegate Layman, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Morgan, in, in reading over this bill, I could not tell because, you know, I would think after three years on ENT, I'd be used to dealing with these hunting bills, but as Delegate Healy and Delegate Harrison can tell you, it gets very confusing. I'm trying to understand with this addition of Prince George's and this issue of distance, by adding Prince George's, it looked to me like we did not have any rules even allowing for archery um, because it's not as if Prince George's was mentioned elsewhere, it was added to a list that describes the distance. Um, and so can you shed any light on that? Did we, did we not allow archery hunting prior to this? No. Um, so the, the, basically the way the, the bill um, or basically the law as it was before this amendment, um, it would say that for those that are archery hunting in Prince George's County, um, the distance that they're prohibited from firing those um, bows, uh, for lack of a better term, um, would be 150 yards because that's that's the overarching. Yeah, okay. Um, well, um, Jay, we have on your radar. Oh, sorry. Um, Delgan Holmes, can you mute yourself? Um, so, okay, so, what, so yeah. what was it before? Before there was this distance, there was no distance or? No, so so the the general distance, the general rule is 150 yards. Um, for any, for uh, a firearm or any other deadly weapon, which the archery um, would fall, uh, fall within that um, designation. There are some counties in which for specifically archery, um, that safety zone is shrunk to 50 yards. They were Calvert, Carroll, Cecil, Frederick, Harford, uh, Montgomery, St. Mary's and Washington County. Um, this just adds Prince George's County to that list. So um, whereas before, no matter what um, firearm was being used, it, the distance, the safety zone distance in Prince George's County was 150 yards. Now it's all 150 yards except for arch archery, in which case it's shrunk to 50. Delegate Walker. Uh, thank you. Mine is, I, I had concerns about that distance. Why would we shrink the distance? Why, what was the intent on doing that? I mean, 50 yards is, I, mean, I could throw a football still 50 yards. Uh, I'm thinking with our density that we have, uh, I, I'm just trying to get the rationale for shrinking the distance. I know in years past when this bill's come up, you know, folks like uh, we didn't want people hunting that close to some houses and parks and things like that. I'm just curious why we're shrinking it. So, Delegate Walker, I, I cannot speak to the intent of the bill. Um, uh, that's not in my purview, but, um, and Senate, it looks like Senator Jackson still isn't here. So I, I can't answer that question specifically. I can just tell you what the bill does. Yeah, uh, I, I know. I, I figured that, but I was just wondering if any, if there was any technical reason why it was done, but okay, thank you. Not that I'm aware of. And Mr. Morgan, uh, this bill was already voted out the delegation as well, correct? That's correct. Yep. Delegate Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a question about, I mean, just the delegate, the delegation's recommendation on the amendment for the bill that's already in the committee. The only, the only thing that concerns me, um, particularly in my district, we do have 
um, an actual archery park with parks and planning that's in um, on New Hampshire Ave in the Langley Park area up on your way to University of Maryland. So I guess I'm just a little bit um, concerned. Um, I'll, I'll, um, so I'm, I support Delegate Walker's concerns about the distance. I'm a little unsure, but I, I don't want to infringe on the bill necessarily. So I was just asking about you know, is the delegation's, I guess, the opinion or support of the amendment required or they would, the the committee of jurisdiction would be taking a position on the bill regardless of this for today or like, or I guess the greater question is, is it up for a vote soon that they need it today or that we could find out a little bit more? I'm not aware of when they're planning on voting on this bill. Um, I, I don't have that information, but because because this amendment is specific to Prince George's County, that's why the standing committee needs um, the recommendation of you all. Um, if it was if it was more broad amendment, it wouldn't need to come back um, to to the delegation. But uh, as as it is, um, the delegation needs to. They're they're going to be waiting on a letter of support or non-support for this uh, amendment, no matter what. Um, so, but I don't know when exactly they plan on voting on it. Ready. Uh, on the amendment, I know that we already uh, had our, our voice vote. Uh, Delegate Fisher, do you have any concerns with this legislation moving forward with the amendment? I, I do, but I, I won't stop anything. I'll I'll maybe I'll I'll reach out to Senator Jackson and, and ask. Um, that's that's the only archery that I know particularly in my district. It's an archery park, and so um, I guess this bill. I don't know if you just do arch I don't know anything about archery so I don't know if it's you just go outside and do your own archery and as long as it's the 50 yards so I'm happy to just sort of figure it out on my own but if the whole delegation is concerned I'll leave it up to you all voice vote um the amendment was passed favorable uh, thank you Mr. Morgan on um, to Senator Jackson we hope that you will have some of these conversations with a few of our members as well um with that is there any other business no, no, Mr. Chair, that, that is all of the business of the law enforcement subcommittee. And for the delegation as a whole? All right, um, Ms. Crystal, would you mind um, going over uh, if we have any guests for next week scheduled already? Yeah, sure, next week we'll have Dr. Golson speaking from the, she's the CEO of the Prince George's County Public School Systems. And I'm not sure what time we'll begin, but most likely around 9 a.m. next week, Friday. Thank you so much. And Ms. Abelight, you've been doing so much work for this delegation over the year. I just want to personally thank you as well. Um, it looks like there's no other business. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. This concludes the uh, hearing of the Prince George's County House delegation. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Good job.